Tuesday evening. How are we all doing? It's half past six on a Tuesday evening. Switch off Clyde, switch off Radio Scotland and listen to me and Boise, bringing you the first episode of the new and hopefully improved Screamer Celica. Now, for you who have been about, seen this previously, me and Paul used to do this slightly different, but we've gave the place a bit of a facelift. It's a bit like men behaving badly now, and, and, we're, going, and we're going to go with it. We're, we're going to jump in the DeLorean and go back to Celtic. Go back to Celtic. And we're going to use the archive, eh? Because we've, ah. we've got quite a lot of archive. We, we've got... We've got uh, programs, we've got old Celtic views, we've got uh, Celtic fanzines. So what we're basically going to do is what I've done this week, I just went up the stairs, went in my loft and picked one out. <laughs> so, and the first one I picked out is going to take us back to the 1st of February 2000. First things first though, Russell, how are you? How are you? Look, before we get into it, how, how, um, how are you feeling about this? I'm late, good, mate. It's not, as late, it's, it's not as late as what we thought we were going to be. So no, <laughs> I've rushed about a wee bit to get ready for it, but you know, I've just got shots like these lying about, Kev, so it was all good, mate. I was, uh, no, I I've been looking forward to it for a while, mate. Looking forward to it for a while. I think the shirt suits the theme that we're, that we're hitting. Where we're going to have football and music and anything culture, uh, anything at cu- culture at the time. Is that a pretty green one? Is that a pretty yeah, green one? Pretty right. green in the Celtic colours, eh? Ah, that's not too bad. <laughs> Wonder why they went bust. They see the amount of wee gadgets you actually see with pretty green gear on. It makes, you wonder, it makes you wonder how they went bust, but obviously it's all these fancy boutique shops. You ever been in the, the, the pretty green shop in uh, London? Aye, I have. Uh, and I mean, it's, the, the expense was obviously crazy, but I thought aye. it was quite cool the concept of like clothes and music going together again. I think it has been, it'd been a while since, and I know people could say what they want about BDI at the time or whatever, but the fact of the matter was, it did unite a band with a style of clothing that I don't think had been seen in a hell of a long time. You were going to gigs then, if you were going to see BDI or, or you know, the Stereophonics, we'll talk about them. But if you were going to any of those sort of gigs um, at that time, well, even probably still now to an extent, but at that period when the Pretty Green first kicked off, it was the first time that I'd really noticed, like, there was almost a... It was like folk were going in club kits, you know what I mean? <laughs> if you're like we're in, like we're in Celtic tops, it's like, it's the exact same principle. So I, you talk, got, I like the club, right? Uh, yeah, you talk about club kits and the they've released the Umbro stuff, eh? Like for yes. Liam Gallup, what Liam had at Main Road, the 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 was it the training top that you the up training at, top, the, the, the Umbro training top that you picked up at the the, the dressing room before he actually went on. Um, I know. It's, it's, it's mad that it's really mad how football fashion for me I'm, I'm a 90, I'm a 90s kid uh, slightly older than yourself but growing, growing up and the rest <laughs> oh cheeky we've already had the first dig in we're only three minutes 21 <laughs> seconds in here we go here we go um, but the first time that fashion football and music came together was round about the Britpop era, for me anyway. It probably goes back to the baggy era with the Happy Mondays, the Stone Roses. Bands then started, I suppose it's in 1992, but when football became fashionable. Uh, to, oh, yeah, yeah. to guys like Tim Lovejoy and, so, uh, what was the name of it? Is it still on? Uh, Soccer so AM, Soccer AM right. started and stuff like that. Eh? So... Round about that time, that was the first time that I really started noting. Well, obviously, I had noticed that the, the 80s casuals, because uh, I used to go to Stur- watch Sterling Albion and Anfield, and yep. every so often you would see you would see all these guys turning up with clothes that us chukters and woolly backs, as they used to call us, wouldn't they have a clue what they were. All these labels, all these feeler, like... Adidas trainers that you had never seen in that. And that, that that's when you come from a, a small town like, well, I suppose Stirling's a city now, but it's not really that that small. But we're always years behind. We're always no. like at least 18 <laughs> months behind with fashion, music, uh, trends, sometimes, sometimes years and years behind. But if you look at things like Rave, I think Scotland was behind the rave because you look at all the acid house parties in 88, 89, and we were still getting that in 91, 92. It, mm-hmm. seemed, to, it seemed to catch up here, eh? And I, I think it's just a Scotland, just, just a Scotland thing, eh? That we all seem to be behind. But 
this this shows unashamedly nostalgic, and it is, go- it is, it is, it is going to, it is going to be nostalgic. So, as I say, at the start of it, we're going to go back to the the first of February two thousand. I wonder if anybody can remember who Celtic were playing on the first of February two thousand. Now, just for clarity, I mean, I get asked to do the show. Obviously, I'm jumping about like an excited wee boy. I'm like, yes, <laughs> they must like me. I'm going to be on another show. And uh, Kev tells me the format. I was buzzing with that. And I thought, this is going to be great fun, man. Can't wait to find out the first game. And he pulls this one out the bag. Um, I have to be honest to you. I didn't. I couldn't remember it. I honestly couldn't remember it. And I don't know how that's. Because, you know, at that age, the age I was at that time, 12 and a half, 13, I mean, that's all you were doing was watching the football then. So I don't know how this one has slipped under my radar, but uh, I've really enjoyed um, looking back on it, uh, obviously, ahead of tonight. It's been cool. It's a strange game. It's it's a game and a period of Celtic's history, which when I picked up the Celtic view, and had a look at it, I'm going, there's not really much in there. Then when I saw this game, there was a few things jumped out at me, and I says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this game, because it was a big deal. It wasn't really a big deal at the time, but it's a big European name arrives at Celtic Park for what was cha- what was called the Millennium Challenge match. That's right. so, so Celtic played Bayern Munich, this night on the 1st of February, eh, on the 1st of February 2000. And you wonder, Millennium Challenge match, what kind of what kind of mess is this? So it's extremely obvious that even though the ticket prices, I've even got the ticket prices here, the ticket prices were the ticket prices were 12 quid for adults, six pounds for concessions. You can't kind of get that now when you think about the prices now. Um to see the team that was in the European Cup final six months before at the New Camp yep. again yep. against Man United. So, so Celtic have says this is a millennium challenge match. John Barnes comes out and says it's a chance for us to to test ourselves against the cream of Europe. Yep. Which is quite fair enough, because we were only seven days be getting put out on our arse by Inverness Cali. And that happened seven days later. And that happened seven days later. So the tickets for this game must have been slow because they then decided to use the game to name the Lisbon Lions stand and get the Lisbon Lions out on the pitch. So so they they decided to use the Lisbon Lions, but still only 20,261 turned up on a very, very, very cold um, February evening to watch Bayern Munich 1-2-1. Now, um, for me, this Bayern Munich team, are the ultimate Bayern Munich team. Mm-hmm. When I think about Bayern Munich, these guys are my favourite Germans just after Kraftwerk and just <laughs> j- just before the... the Rammstein. Two- <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the 2014 World Cup winners. Um, you've got guys like Oliver Kahn, uh, Babo, Elber, uh, Matthias, Matthias. Scholl, yeah. Ken, I mean, you I mean Oliver Kahn, he was like a cabbage pat doll in steroids, wasn't he? He was massive. Uh, yeah. Lisa Lisa Azu was a wee mighty mouse on on, on the, the on left the wing. wing but, yeah. the left wing, eh? uh, up front, you've got uh, Elber. Elber Santa Cruz. Now, this was this was a team. If you ever, have you ever watched the, the that European Cup final back uh, in nineteen ninety nine? Do you remember? Oh, uh, what, uh, right. Bayern Munich were the better side that night. A hundred percent. Bayern Munich were the better side that night. But everybody forgets the 89 minutes before uh, all Sheringham and all Gunny Solskjaer decided to get to get into that. For me, Bayern Munich were the best team in Europe coming to Celtic Park that night. What do you what would you what do you remember about that being a being a school guy? No, I think that's fair. I, I think when you talk about a uh, Bayern Munich team you would associate with, I think the biggest compliment you can give about that European final was they got beat off the Man United team that I would also hold in that exact same regard, Kev. When I think of a Man United team, if you mention Man United to me, it's it's that lineup. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's York and Cole and it's Keane and 
Beckham and Giggs and that is the guys that you, I think come straight into your into your mindset. So it was two real iconic sides in that uh, European Cup final. Someone's got to lose, put it that way. Um, mm-hmm. But I no doubt about it for Celtic to be pulling in a team like that uh, uh, for a friendly mid-season um, for a Millennium Challenge, also known as then the opening of the uh, Lisbon Lions stand, was quite the coup. Um, I was I thought as soon as you you obviously sent me the details, I had a look into the you know I was looking at the overview of it with the lineups and the attendance stood out to me straight away. It jumped out like a sore thumb, um, and especially because of the the quality of the opposition. Now I thought maybe it's Bayern played the reserve team. You look through the lineup and you're going, you know, it was all the big hitters playing, sprinkled with of course the likes of you know Rocky Santa Cruz back then must have been. 18, 17, 18 coming on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so th- there was a there was a future there as well. I mean, Mateus playing and all that in it starting. I mean, it's almost like they, they were taking the game seriously <laughs> with that with a lineup like that. I was a wee bit I was a wee bit surprised at the crowd. To put it into context, Celtic were meant to play Inverness on the Saturday before and the game got cancelled uh, basically because a part of the roof blew off a part of the gutter and it was a horrible night and it was a really horrible weather and I, I just think it was at that point but the attendance maybe reflects what was going on at Celtic yeah. at that time the apathy within the support that we kind of hindsight's easy to guess that we <laughs> that we know that that we know that there was like shite round the corner <laughs> there was, within the next seven days everything was going to pop uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, easy, that's easy to say with hindsight but at the time when I saw when I saw that attendance I was like that's a reflection of where the Celtic support uh, were at that point yeah. and we're talking about Man United, one of the greatest ever Man United signs and I, I completely agree with you when I think of Man United I think of that team that that's mm-hmm. a man for for me. That's the greatest side Ferguson ever ever yeah. built. Um, I agree. It's, it's a fantastic side, and that's a level at that point we could only dream of. Uh, that season in Europe, we played a uh, Cumbrand Town, uh, and then we eventually got ended up getting put out with with Leon. Uh, that obviously the Henrik. He, yeah, Larson, Larson had that devastating injury that night. But Larson's replacement, uh, everybody thought it was going to be Mark Burchill. And Mark Burchill scored that night. Yes. Uh, and so what, what's your memories of, you, you're a wee laddie at this point, what's your memories of Mark Burchill? I, I remember thinking he was going to be the next the next big thing for Celtic coming through. And I know we were talking on a Celtic state of mind recently, I think. Uh, it was Paul was talking about, you know, when was the last time Celtic brought through a goal scorer? And I think he went way back before Butchell, but my memories, and obviously, I mean, you're up there slightly tinged when you're young because you're looking for icons left, right and centre, but I always remember Butchell being someone I thought was definitely going to be destined for more than what he probably achieved in the game. Having said that, I dare say he went down south and made a pretty penny down there because he played for some big clubs, Portsmouth, Ipswich, and all that. And I think when he was... Uh, when he was coming through Celtic, I'm sure he scored a number of goals in his first sort of, you know, he's clearly not reading any stats here, but I'm sure he got, a, you know, a, a decent return of goals in his first few appearances. Um, and and Butchell, I think, definitely was someone that if he'd been, I don't know, it was difficult, obviously, it was difficult. But when you look at who eventually did replace him, then the manager obviously never had much faith in him that season when uh, Ian Wright was the, the alternative. And I think that was a, a missed trick, that one, you know, because Butchel had never shown anything. But um, looking back, he was quite ruthless. He didn't seem to be shy. He, had, he was a wee bit cocksure, which is a good thing to have. I think if mm-hmm. you're a striker especially, you need that. Um, and fast forwarding a wee bit, I always remember Sean Maloney had a bit of that about him as well. He was quite underestimated that way. I remember Maloney starting against uh, Stuttgart. I know we're going to different tangents already. No, no. But I, that, that's where we want. That's where we're going. This is a, I, this is a parallel universe podcast. So we can go uh, I remember Maloney starting um, against Stuttgart because Larson, I think, had the, the broken jaw. Mm-hmm. And we, there was a concern, right? Maloney's the replacement. And he scored. We beat him 3-1 and he scored. And I just thought, you know, he's cool and calm. I think 
the same Virtual could have went on to have had a similar career at Celtic. And, you know, it maybe is a sliding doors moment. Henrik's injury should have probably opened the door for Mark Virtual, um, as opposed to being shut by a veteran coming up for a last payday, which you, you're talking about the fans there um, and the low numbers there. Maybe it was examples of that that did show a disconnect because the fans never bought, I don't, from my memory, didn't buy into Ian Wright win the slightest, you know? No. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a move that the fans wanted. And you look, if you think of Butchell, Butchell would have scored more goals, by the way, for the record than what Ian Wright did as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if, he'd played those, made, uh, if he'd played the majority of games between Larson's injury and the end of the season, Butchell would have outshone what Wright did. So, uh, And that would have been one of our own doing it. So I think there would have definitely have been more of a connection. That's just one example, of course. I know that, that you know there was a lot of car crashes along the way that season. But um, I certainly think Guy Butchell, funny as well that he scored against Bayern Munich, you know, and a friend like that. But when you're looking at the lineup you're playing, the, the pedigree they've got, the reputation they've got, you've got to have something about you to be doing it, even in a friendly. Even in a friendly. Mm-hmm. Well, you have a look at the Celtic team. I'll read the Celtic team out for that night. You had Kerr, who was replaced by Dimitri Karin Karin. at halftime. Yep. Uh, Wee Jackie, uh, Johan Mialbe, Alan Stubbs. Uh, Mialbe came on in the second half as well, sorry. Alan Stubbs. Paul Lambert came on for Alan Stubbs in the 60th minute. Tom Boyd, Stefan Maye, Stan Petroff, Colin Healy, Fernando Diorniles. <laughs> Bobby Petter, Reggie Blinker came on for Petter in the seventy first minute, Matt Butchell and Mark Mark Viduka um came on as well. Eh? You look at that Celtic team, and I know we've, we've spoke about recently that the size of the rebuild that, that we've got in the summer mm-hmm. uh, is as big as any time from this period. And I'll have a look at that team and I'm going, well, Matt Viduka was not a bad player even though we did sell him in the summer. Uh, that was the first first player out the door. Uh, you've got Jackie. You've got Johan Mialbe. Well, fair enough. Johan's Swe- Swedish internationalist. Yep. He became a massive player for Martin O'Neill. You had Stubbs was probably unlucky that he got, a, that he got his um, a illness that, yep. that, 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 that summer. Paul Lambert, European Cup winner. Now, on this night, Paul Lambert's been been reunited with the manager that he won the European Cup. With. That's right. So, yes. obviously, so obviously, the Celtic media went all, all, went all over that, the meeting of old minds. Tom Boyd played a decent played a decent part the following season for Martin O'Neill. He was not a bad player, was Tom Boyd. Stan Petroff became an, an utterly fantastic player. We could actually dedicate a whole podcast to Stan Petroff, truthfully. And I think we probably will at one point. Because Aye. for me, Petroff, Petroff was possibly the... I'm known Paul McStay class, but when you talk about a modern midfielder, Petroff had everything. And I haven't seen a midfielder that's got anywhere near Petroff in the last 20 years. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think, see, just even before you go through any more of the lineups, see even who you've named there, you look at the 6 2 win, obviously the one that, you know, Chris Sutton's on record saying so many times that's what changed the whole landscape, changed that day, even though the next, the reverse fixture was a 5 1 defeat. The, 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 the you know, the, 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 the wins had changed or whatever that saying is. Um, but Mary, I'm sure, started that game. Mialbi probably did. Lambert did. Boyd did. Petrov did, uh, Peta did because he was unbelievable, um, and then you're looking at obviously you've got the return of Henrik and, and obviously the, the introduction of Sutton. But I think when we talk about big rebuilds at times, it's easy to get, it's easy to think that when when O'Neill took over this team, he brought in seven or eight players at once. What O'Neill's key thing was that he did when he took over, I would argue this for anyone, is he made who was there better. That is what his key attribute was. Yes, he was given money to bring in players, but I think that there's sometimes a misconception that Lennon, Thompson and Hartson all arrived in that first summer as well. They didn't. Thompson was further down the line that season. Uh, Lennon was further down the line that season. Um, yeah, and then you're looking at Hartson was the following summer. Um, so it's not, it's not quite the case that he completely you know, had a different first delivery to work with from, from the year before. What O'Neill's best trait was, he made players better. 
he got that start lineup that John Barnes had, and he got more out than what John Barnes could. Do you know what I mean? David Kelly makes a point um, saying, "Oh, it's just actually moved there." Uh, David Kelly says, "We we aren't gotcha. compa- uh, there. We go. We aren't comparing comparing that squad to now, are we? No, we're no. Uh, we added tens of millions to that squad as well. In today's terms, that was the equivalent of a." Of about a hundred million, we are in a complete mess. I'm going yeah. to go. I'm going to go with Russell here. I agree with Russell. The point is, a manager came in and made the players already in that squad better, and that's what we're looking to do in the summer as well. We yeah. need we need we need a head. We're not, we're not going to get a manager like Martin O'Neill. We're going to get a head coach. It's going to yes. come in, and he's got to improve the players that are there. What I would probably say is, I still think we've got a core of decent players in the squad just now, like we had at that at that time. We're not comparing them in ability wise. I'm just yeah. talking about where we are. I think we've got a decent squad there, if you get a competent head coach to come in, can improve. So when people say there's a massive rebuild, I'm going, if you get the right man, I don't think there is as big a rebuild as what people are saying. Maybe that's me just being too optimistic. No, I think you're spot on. I think it's absolutely the case, Kev. I think definitely. I mean, we've seen it time and again. It's not about comparing the squads like for like, and it's not about comparing the transfer budgets like for like. It's about looking at the fundamentals of can a manager improve what he's got to work with and then obviously is he going to get back with the tools necessary to also then enhance that squad further because there's not one manager worth their soul who takes a job and goes, all oh, right, it's fine, I'll just work with everyone that's already there. They all come in and ask, how much am I getting to spend? <laughs> what are you going to give me to work with? And then what I think the biggest sign of a good manager is is then can they improve? Yes, okay, we'll give you what you want, right? We'll give you what you want in terms of uh, finance and, and you know identifying players, etc. But then what are you going to do with the ones that are already there? Because you can't change 11 for 11. You can't change squads of 16 for squads of 16. It doesn't happen. And I think when you look back at that John Barnes team, there's a huge disconnect you're talking about. The season was obviously about to enter free fall um, a week later against Inverness Cali. Um, with the headline and all that nonsense. And then you're actually, when you look at it player for player and you're going through it, you know, you're thinking, well, you know, a lot of them are still hanging about the next season and smashing it out of the park. And you're looking at the subs not used. Ian Wright had been scored as Arsenal's record goal scorer and I Berkovic was the club's record signing at 5.75 million at that time. They couldn't even get on the pitch that night. It's, do you know, it's, it's funny because maybe I'm not, this isn't me now going to have a pop at John Barnes in particular, but quite clearly something was amiss here, whether it, the whole mood in the camp had went. And I think when we're looking at this season, uh, or next season, I should say, going ahead, whilst, yeah, it does feel like something's amiss, these are, this squad isn't, you know, needing completely, you know, pulled out, you know, wrecked and, 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 and completely overhauled. That's the order of but. Um, they're no needing that. They're needing, they're needing someone to come in, sprinkle a couple of bits of magic dust in the ones that are going to stay, and then add quality to that. And it can be done any era. It doesn't matter about whether, as I said, Martin O'Neill was a myth that he came in and spent £20 million when he, when he first joined Celtic. And you hear it all the time on the radio when they talk about that rebuild job. He came in and he spent £20 million. No, he didn't. Now, so he spent Mark Viduca money on Sutton. That's what he did. He got uh, he got a tune out of Petrov. He turned Petrov in from a right back into the best centre midfielder I think in in the country. I think you're right to point that out. Um, he had Paul Lambert back to his best. He made Bobby Pett a, a Jinky Johnson for two <laughs> for, for a season. It was amazing. He, he turned fifty thousand pounds. Did he a gap? Mm-hmm. He he, re- he resurrected Johan Melby's career from a holding midfielder to a centre half. All of this goes amiss. And he also operated with Stefan Mahe at left back that first season. Stefan Mahe, until he got Thompson in, was playing that left wing back role. Mm-hmm. This guy's getting a tune out of everyone. That, it can happen. And, and I am convinced, sorry, I'm going on a wee bit, but I'm convinced that once a, a new manager comes in from the outside and looks at what he's got to work with, and all this, the, back, the dark clouds have gone, and you know it's a reset button, as you've, as you've referred to before, once that happens and a new manager with new eyes is looking at it, he'll go, 
this isn't all so bad, guys. This is not. This isn't as bad as you think. I can work with it. Hugh Riley makes a great po- point. Look at the parallels with Martin O'Neill and Brendan Rodgers, and I think that's more where we are. As you've just you've just perfectly summed up there, Martin O'Neill came in and got a tune out of a lot of the players and all of the squad. Brendan Rodgers came in and made and made Ronnie Dyler's squad basically invincible. Yeah. So so but, so it can happen. It, re- it really can happen and I I'm, maybe I'm just trying to look for the positives going to next season. I know that we're going to lose players. But I still don't I still think if you get the right head coach there is enough in that squad for us to challenge. More than compete. More than compete. More I than think going to a new manager's going to look at that and go it's not as bad as you think. They just need a fresh start. The ones that want to stay, the ones that want to go can go. Like as in the case of Viduka, you know, it's stuff like that. That's just going to that's going to happen. That's inevitable in football. But there will be players there that uh, that do stay that we'll see go on to you know get or should we say getting back to in a lot of their cases um, their true form. You know what I mean? Because there's there's too many good players in that squad now, and there was too many good players um, in the match we're referring to in that lineup to be you know producing the seasons that they have. Definitely, I, I, I do agree. I'm just having a wee look at the, the, the comments here, see if I've missed any cracking ones. Um, <laughs> what I'll do is I'll move on quite quickly. Oh, th- th- that's exactly what I was going to move on to, Paul. Producer Paul was in, in, the, in the background here. Who's Fernando in that midfield that, that you read out, Kev? The Fernando in the midfield was, wait till I get, get my notes, was the international. It was a Peruvian international called Fernando de Ornelas. Um, and he came to Celtic as a trialist at that time. Yeah. Now, can anybody in the comments tell me who his agent was? I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one just out there. The what player, a question. Uh, Didn't he go into the Celtic wiki, by the way? Or you that are sitting there Googling it on your phones <laughs> at the precise moment in time, eh? Uh, so, so, so basically, so, so basically, uh, John Barnes says after the game, we'll make a de- decision about Fernando in the next few days. But I was very pleased with him. He, he has pace. He got plenty of crosses, and he took a knock on the foot just before half time, and that's why he didn't do so well after the break. <laughs> so basically, he had a good first half, then ran out of steam in the second half. <laughs> Um, we got him on a free for Crystal Palace because he did get a contract to the end of the season, and yes. he made and he made two sub appearances uh, for Celtic, both in one one draws at home. No, both times as a sub. It was a two two draw with Dundee and a one one draw with Hibs. That that was the two. That was his only two appearances. That was the only two appearances with Celtic. Consistent, uh, unbeaten. Yes, the un- that's the He's unbeaten, mate. You know, but he ended up. I looked at his career on on Wikipedia before. He ended up like randomly, like five days later, eh, five days, five years later, he joined Olympiacos. I did. But I'm I... sure it's the one in Cyprus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was. I think, I think the Greek ones called it Olympiacos. Pyrus or something, or I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, and it was in Pl- Olympiacos Nicosia he, he, he played for, because I was double-taken. I thought, he must have had something he, about him. He went to Cyprus. It was Cyprus, Andy. Aye, the, 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 aye, aye. Olympiacos. What, what we can say about him is, he basically finished his career in Norway and became a priest. <laughs> That, that's what happened to Fernando de Ornelas. But he also played in the quarterfinal of the 2000... He, 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 he appeared in the greatest ever uh, Peruvian... The, the Peruvian national team, uh, Copa America. So he's a legend, actually, in... in a, 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 wherever he came from. I can't remember where he came from. Paraguay. Paraguay. No, he's Paraguayan. No, he's Peruvian. Oh, I think we need to... I'm sure he's Peruvian, like... No, we're all wrong. We're, we're bloody all wrong. He's Venezuelan. Oh. That was you telling me earlier on he was for Peruvian. <laughs> he's for Venezuela. <laughs> Who's the only other guy for Venezuela to play for Celtic? Oh, very good. Do 
Go for it. Played against Barcelona. Miku wasn't. Miku. Miku was Venezuelan. Was he? No. Uh-huh. So there's only two Venezuelans ever played for Celtic, and it's Fernando Dioniles and Miku. He's often forgotten that he played that night, I think, as well, Miku. He's know, often right? forgotten. He did all right that night, in fact. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you some of the teams, but I'll, I'll answer my first question. Ian Wright was Fernando Dioniles agent. And that Ian Wright brought him to the club from uh, Crystal Palace. So if you wanted to get a handle on the kind of nick the Celtic dressing room was in at that point, you had Ian Wright bringing guys to, to Celtic on trial. That's not right, is it? It's just nah. not, how can your agent be sitting in the same dressing room as you? you know, like, what, what's happening there? That, that, do you know, that's, you look back at that, and it, it, that is kind of, it's, it's embarrassing, let's be honest with you. How that's that's ended up happening. It's like it's like a jobs for the boys. Like, oh, John Barnes knows Ian Wright, so Ian Wright gets to come up to Celtic and play. Ian Wright recommends a player to John Barnes, and they just go, "All oh, right, that'll be fine." It just it's amateur ever stuff. That you know what I mean? Uh, it definitely is. I'm going to read you some of the teams that uh, that that Fernando played for, right? And see if you've heard of any of them. So he played for a uh, Happy Valley. <laughs> Sounds like a yoga. Uh, Maratimo, no, the Portuguese. I've heard of them. South China. He left us and went to Queens Park Rangers. Uh, Nuremberg, Olympiacos, Nicosia. Uh, let's see, an odd Greenland. Now, an odd Greenland in Norway, that's where he ended his career. And he became he became a priest and ran a project called A Goal for Life in Norway, whose aim was uniting all the players who have scored the goal of their life, having Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. You can't Fantastic. beat that, can you? You can't beat here, that. Either. Here's what he throw out there, right? If he played for odd Greenland, what time, what sort of time, year are we talking? 2007-2008 time. Oops, that would have been. was a bit later then. No, because Ronnie Dyler, of course, played for Old Greenland as a centre-back. I'm 99% sure on that because I've got weird... I remember weird stuff, Kev. I don't do stats, but I remember stuff like that. But I would have, imagine if you'd actually played with Ronnie Dyler. That would have been an interesting way. Everything connected, you know? But I, I like that bit. Hopefully somebody out there is Googling that to see, oh, <laughs> to see right. if Fernando Dioniles actually yeah. did play with Ronnie, Ronnie Dyla. That would be, that would be uh, quite amazing. Well, if I know there's a chance anyway. I'm not saying they did, but there is a chance. Maravchik25 says, Happy Valley is a Chinese takeaway in Colt Bridge. Maybe he played for the Chinese <laughs> takeaway in Colt Bridge. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't really know that if he did play for the Chinese takeaway in Colt Bridge. Maybe they had a Sunday League team. Somebody if you go... The Colt Bridge can tell us if it's a good Chinese and if they had a if they had a, a, a Sunday League team. So there's an interesting link. Ronnie Ronnie played for 1993 to 2004. I recognise the team. I was I wasn't far off. I wasn't far off. So a man also played for Bayern Munich uh, and became a. What, what, what can you call it? A representative of the Goal for Life project was Z. Roberto. He went to Greenland as well and spread the word of Jesus and, as their Lord and Saviour uh-huh, to uh, and Fernando D. Ornelas. Yeah. I was going to call it a cult there, but can it be a cult? It's a project. We're a cult. <laughs> <laughs> Axum cult. Um, that's bizarre. Z Roberto is in the Z Roberto. As in Z Roberto went and done a, a what, what do you call them? A getaway or something like that. A weekend where he was a guest saying how God had made him a professional football player. Wow. Well, I don't know how you found that out, but that is mad. That is mad. That, that's unbelievable, eh? And then we're, right. talk, and we're talking about Celtic Bayern Munich. I tell you, this is going to be random. It's going to be random. I like it. I like it, but it's random. 
Sure, I mean, I'm, looking at that, I'm looking at that Bayern lineup because I've got it kind of on a big screen behind me, or behind the camera. I mean, some of those players, like Matthias, obviously, is the touchdown. Elber was one hell of a striker as well, eh? It was, eh? Brilliant, man. Brilliant. Now, Jeremy, you remember him for years in the midfield. Loads of good players there. Loads. As I say, as I say for me, maybe, maybe that was the time uh, where... I paid more attention to European football, but for me, that's the ultimate Bayern side. That's if somebody asked me to name a Bayern side, I see that side in the silver and maroon top. That, that's what I see. I see that Bayern side. See, uh, see, see, just to quickly just say, why do you think you don't pay as much attention to European football now? Uh, probably because I know it's so far away from where we're going to be. Uh, I know that really? there's. Elite level football now. There's only four clubs, five clubs that can ever win the Champions League. So I like the Europa League. I think the Europa League's more balanced. But it was so good, doesn't it? Aye, there's there's more open, eh? Uh, but even that, even I, w- I watched uh, the Hamburg derby last night. Gone St. Pauli, the one one nothing, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But with no fans there, it was it, it struggled wow. to keep. It struggled to keep your attention. The night before, I watched um, Roma against uh, AC Milan. And again, I've been in the Stadio Olimpico. So a lot of people in the comments have been in the Stadio Olimpico. I never went for the Celtic game. I went for a, a Rome derby a couple of years ago. And you, see, and you see that empty, you're going, this is not the same. It is not the same. It just feels like a contractual ob- obligation for people like... For tele companies, that's all it feels like. Uh, there's just some, uh, it, it's, it's just it's just how something's missing. Really, really, something's missing. So F- Fraser Ogilvy, Ribery, Robin, Luen, Muller. That's a buy on side. I get it. I get, uh, I get it. it. I get it. That's but m- m- maybe a bit uh, later for me. I'll, I'll probably s- stop paying attention to that point. But I do get what he sells. I do love the German side of 2014 that won the World Cup. Mm-hmm. I, I do. I thought they played fantastic football. And I was at Scotland against Germany a couple of years ago, and Muller was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Seeing Muller in the flesh was... He didn't seem to run. He didn't seem to move. But, he no. popped up, uh, uh, but he's popped up everywhere. He popped up everywhere and he was absolutely oh, yeah. fantastic. He was a great football still is a great football player. Uh-huh. But, but uh, he, even even then, I think he's been written off by a lot of people. And, he's, and I, I don't think he's turned 30 yet, has he? He just seemed to have been... Yeah, like, I would say he is 30. That would be my guess. My guess would be he is 30. Mm-hmm. Celtic Rambler says, what's the story behind that painting behind you, Kev? The painting behind me is the front cover of the Primal Screams album Screamatelica, where we get our, where we've got the name of this show from. So it's, um, it was on the front cover, so I sort of put it on a canvas, and it's stuck behind my head to make my working from home office seem a bit more interesting. <laughs> um, so Thank me the kids, man, your kids working honestly. <laughs> I couldn't remember the guy's name there, but it was painted by the late Paul Cannell. Uh, and Ooh. it was meant to be a different colour. And the primal screen changed the colour. When you actually see the original painting, it's actually red, white and blue. And the primal screen changed the colour. Close one. <laughs> Close one. I suppose I've I've never told you um, about the time I, I watched Celtic against Lazio with Andrew Innes for the primal screen, but I'm sure Paul says that. Uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul's right there. Andrew Innes did tell us that Alan McGee was told to change it by Bobby Gillespie. Brilliant. Bobby Gillespie telling me to change the colours of the wow. primals, of what became the most iconic logo of the 90s for me. That's oh, the, the most iconic logo of the 90s for me. Um I'm going. I'm going to fire something out here. I'm going to fire something out here. That was the night we we named the. All right, we'll answer that question. Best German to play for Celtic. Compa. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andreas Tom's like the first German I remember. He was top drawer. I thought for 
a season or maybe a couple of seasons. Obviously, that goal against Rangers as well with Tom. Um, Hinkle we had as well, didn't we? I'm just naming German players now. Try to think. Uh, Hinkle was steady at right back, like him. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many other Germans have we had to play for us. Andy Tom, everyone's saying, so I was right first time. Get in there. Uh, the first one that came <laughs> to my head was Andy Tom. Uh, ah, I, 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 I loved Andy Tom. Um, I, I thought he was a fantastic player. Hinkle, when you look at Hinkle's career, we would we would probably not get um, a player of Andy Hinkle's standard no coming, to, coming to Scotland. Um, 24, I think he was 25 or 20, 24, 25 when he joined uh, uh, Celtic Hinkle. And, you know, he obviously was a German international by then. Mm-hmm. Horror of the games. <laughs> we Joe Miller, very good. <laughs> That's bad. Hinkle um, again. Hinkle like Tom was. I could be wrong here, but I, was it was he not kind of plagued with injuries as well towards the end of, to, towards the end of Celtic career? But Andy Tom, Andy Tom was a sign of the future when he signed under Tommy Burns. I've never seen a player with. I remember the first time I saw him. It was his pace, and you were like that. Gee, whoosh, that's unbelievable. Yeah. I've never seen a guy with a burst of pace like that. Mm. Eh? Um, the goal the goal that he scored at Ibrox. I always remember the goal he scored against Dundee United in the Scottish I knew Scottish you were going to say that. Was that was that when you were gone? Ah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I don't right. no, but I... I don't know exactly what I thought of it. When the temporary stand goes my, mental. 2-1. <laughs> oh, that was brilliant. Talking about the temporary stand and stands, obviously... They used the Lisbon Lions c- come and came onto the pitch that night to name the Lisbon Lions stand. Yeah. So the Celtic the, the Celtic program, um Celtic at this point had set up a page called Net Boys. So obviously this was the early reaches of the internet and they spell boys with a Z at the end. So they're trying to be hip and trendy, where people could like email it, like where people could email in and give their views. So basically, the Lisbon Lions stand was named after a poll on Netboys, right? Wow. Now, everybody says it was fixed. Everybody says that the fact that the Lisbon Lions got 65% of the votes was fixed. It was always going to be called the Lisbon Lions fans, but they wanted to, they wanted to bring it, get the fans involved in naming this stand. So second in the poll was Fergus McCann. So 20% wanted to call it the Fergus McCann stand. Okay. Uh, 6% wanted to call it the John Thompson stand. 4% wanted to call it the Brother Walford stand. 3% the Jimmy McGrory stand. And other names uh, <laughs> fired up were Willie Mealy. Paul McStay, Henrik Larson, Jimmy du- Jimmy Johnson, Kenny Douglas. That would have been funny if they would have named it the Kenny Douglas and what was going to happen in the following months. And Wim Janssen. But when I was reading, it, reading this in the programme, um, somebody actually put, I'm going to read this out, uh, a, f- a few thrown in for good measure who were not Celts but do have a place in our hearts. Uh, one was Albert Kidd. Somebody wanted to call it the Albert Kid East Stand. I think okay. we could all I think we could all go on board with that. And this is a bizarre one. This is a really, really bizarre one. The Ali Mitchell East Stand for the goal he scored for Kilmarnock against Rangers on the second day in nineteen ninety-eight. That's tragic, eh? <laughs> that, that, is is tragic. that is absolutely we tragic. Would, we would pain them for that, you know what I mean? We would pain them oh, for that. I, th- I think that's just absolute pettiness. <laughs> like who, who would who would spend their time emailing and going? I'm going to go with a Kilmarnock player that nobody's really any heard of, but I want a stand named after him because he scored a, <laughs> because he scored a ninety fifth minute a ninety fifth minute goal against uh, Kilmarnock. He, uh, he's written, I mean, he's, to me, it's just I think I think Celtic as a, as a fan base as well has moved on a lot from that. I think there's I think what's been so Almost refreshing about obviously the Celtic state of mind pods and all that this season has been Celtic fans are willing to take ownership when their club's doing shite. Do you know what I mean? We're willing to go, this isn't good enough. And we'll look within. Whereas, to be honest with you, across the city, we were told that Mark Robert was a world beater. You know what I mean? We were told that, you know, and they did that. Even Graham Murray, when he was in charge, they were all jumping about celebrating all that when they got Drew with us. 
I mean, stuff like you look back and there was never any sort of self-reflection of, do you know what, we are crap and we are doing rubbish and maybe we are skint or whatever. It was always, you know, they, maybe, maybe I don't know, but I just think Celtics moved very far away from the, the tip for tat nonsense, you know what I mean? And it's all about if Celtic aren't doing well, I like the fact that we blame Celtic for that. You know, I like I like that attitude. I think it's a common statement now is well, only Celtic can beat Celtic. I kind of like that because, okay, there's an element of arrogance to it, but we deserve to be arrogant for the dominance that we've had in the last decades, you know, and, and it's time that we got back to Back to being like that, but yeah, I think this season we've definitely um, Celtic. Don't, I'm, I don't, I don't care. You know, if, if Rangers were to, you know, it'd be like celebrating if they lost their unbeaten record in the league or something. I mean, it doesn't mean anything to me. The only matter to me is as long as it's Celtic to do it. You know what I mean? De- definitely, I, 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 I agree. I, I agree with you. Uh, it's like, see, for the only me, reason I'll be annoyed if they go unbeaten is because I mean we've not beat them in the next the next two times we play them. That's Aye. the only reason I'll be annoyed about it. I'm not going to be anno- I'm not going to be cheering if, you know, I mean Stevie May scores for St Johnston. Do you know what I mean? Like against them in the last minute, I don't care. That's not. That's. I think the mentality has moved on from there now. Um, I, I agree with you. I, I've moved on as well. But then I've kind of settled myself that uh, they are going to win it at Celtic Park because I reckon that's written the way their seasons went. They're, mm. they're, they're whatever, whatever they call their journey is going to end by them winning the league at Celtic Park. And I can't see that no happening because, again, it's terrible to actually speak about, but I think the football gods have actually says that. That's what's mm. going to happen. That's what, the football sometimes, sometimes like, throws up these quirks and I just can't see, the way I watch football, I just can't see, like, that no happening. Because it, it, because it seems like everything's heading for that. Anything that could, could go wrong for us has went wrong. Everything that could go right for them has went right. So you're looking at it, you're looking at it, and you're going, "This, this is." Remember, remember when we stopped the, the, the remember when we stopped the F10. They won yep. it itself the part the following season. They they won it three nothing game. Hugh Dallas got hit with a coin. That's right, of course, of course. I think that's football's got a habit of throwing up these things. So I, I do think that um, it could actually happen. I, I've, made, I've made my peace with it if it does happen. They can have that moment on the go. There's this is going to be a light-hearted show, Kev. You've just let ah, right, right, right. everyone away now. Right, let, let's, let, let's move on to music. Right <laughs> let's move on. So when this game was played... Britney Spears was number one where she was born to make us happy. Right. A piece of pop rubbish. And look what we did to her. I know. You know? I know. She, she ended up, I ended up giving her a haircut seven years <laughs> later. And, 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 she's never, and she's never recovered since. Uh, Travis were number one in the album charts with the man who? Mm-hmm. And EastEnders was just about to celebrate its 15th birthday, which is actually quite mad when you have You just thought it was older than that. Yeah. No. That theme tune, that theme tune's Brian May's wife singing, isn't it? She actually sings that theme tune. Does she? And, uh, and, 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 and it's called Anyone Could Fall in Love. I'll not sing it, but it goes with the EastEnders jingle, eh? And it's Brian May's wife. She's you you can't fire that out. You can't fire that out and not sing it. <laughs> no, you're all right. So one of those. No, no, no. We're doing but <laughs> Folk will be raging enough with all the, all the uh, illusions of the title getting lost at Celtic Park without me then <laughs> seriously turning the viewers away. Right. So. Oh, rubbish. Rubbish. Pop rubbish. Well, this, yeah, if you like Britney Spears, you like Britney Spears. It's, I think, eh, uh, hit me baby one more time I think it's a fantastic song it's a brilliant song uh, it reminds me I'm, I'm going, to, going, to, going to talk about going to talk about this but in the year 2000 I worked in a a, a warehouse for a farm supply company and I had been paid off a, a couple of years earlier uh, I, was a tra- I was a trainee auctioneer that, that's what I was I was a trainee auctioneer and I got paid off because of the uh, 
the BSE crisis, fun, funnily enough, right? So I got a job working. I got a job working in a warehouse at a farm supply company, and basically right. what I'd done by this point, I'd blew all my redundancy money on watching Celtic in Europe and going out, going everywhere and buying trainers and stuff like that. As you do, well, as you do when you're twenty three, twenty four. And when I worked in this warehouse, um, the all they played was Radio One, so you had the the usual Radio One playlist at that time. So what me and Russell have done for that week, we've picked two singles, a single each and an album that reminds us of that time, right? Uh, so what's your single for that week, Russell? It was the Artful Dodger featuring Craig David. Uh, rewind when the crowd say, Mal Selector. Um, that's, that's what I mean... Obviously, it went on, that song went on to create, which I thought was an extremely funny uh, few series by Avid Merian, Bo Selecta. Obviously, it catapulted Craig David into having the mediocre pop career that he's had. Um, with a, do I have it on my Spotify playlist? No. But it did stand out to me because I think there was a change. I remember it being the sort of same sort of time as like Daniel Beddingfield saying he wrote songs in the garage and that, man. <laughs> You're like, right, okay. It's just pop-tastic. Um, kidding on that it's all underground sort of music but aye that was the one that stood out for me just because that Bo Selector I just thought it was quite poignant that, that song actually created a title of a series that obviously was huge for years you know what I mean the, the, the Bo Selector one uh, who'd have thought that at the time but I'm sure it was the number one as well that Paul Dodger one with Craig David but again it's like you're saying Radio 1's on all the time I was at this point and what Primary seven or first year at school, first year at school, I think it was. You know, that was that was the sort of music that you listened to all the time. You know, what I mean, it was never off. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, so, but, but, I just just so that everyone knows. I mean, I know someone's half baked and says it's pure gold, but I mean, the song's not pure gold. Just so no, you know, no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not advocating going like home half baked and listening to Craig David or full baked. Or just Stone Cold Sober. I'm not saying any of that uh, for, for Craig David and the Apple Dodger. I just thought the song kind of, it stood out because Craig David ended up going on to have um, obviously a famous impersonation. I think the most famous impersonation by Avon Merian. And it was all after that song, Bo Selector. You, 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 talk, you talk about Bo Selector and that. I, I just picture... Avid Merrin, and all I see is a, and a striker that used to play for Aberdeen. What was it, Avid Stravum? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Norwegian guy. Craig David, that, that yeah. song, anytime you hear that Artful Dodger song, all, all you do is think of Bo Select, all you do is think of the telly series. You, you don't really think of the song, but. but exactly. But you're right. It's like it was played all the time. And if yep. you were, a, 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 if you were like in the car, at my work, you would hear that all the time. And the yep. one that I picked is not a song that I particularly like, but yep. even if I still hear it now, it reminds me of fleeing about in the forklift delivering pallets of cattle food <laughs> like, <laughs> to, 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 to farmers, eh? And it was Len, Steal My Sunshine. Ah, uh, Peach, man. That is a good song. I like that song, in fairness. Um, so it was at number 11 that week, and I'd been doing nine places because it was like... Um, I was at number two, and I thought they were Americans. And when I was looking into it again, they're actually Canadians, and they're, right. a, brother and, they're a brother and sister. Mm-hmm. And uh, the sample that's built out see see the see the start yeah. right? do, 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 It's actually built. It's actually sampled a disco tune by the Andrea True Connection. More, more, more. Yes, I, I knew it was a sample. Did, did you get that was a sample? Genuinely yeah. did know it was a sample. I, I don't know how, but I knew that's where you were going to go with it. But I think it's a tune. It's, 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 when you hear it, it's catchy. I mean, it's good. The, it's summer summertime. When it comes on the radio, you're turning it up a wee notch. I find definitely. I'm, I'm sure eh, Heart FM still probably plays it when the summer comes out along with what's his name, Will Smith's. Uh, yes. Summer time, that is uh, <laughs> Miami. Um, I just think it's one of these songs that takes me back to that time. I didn't like it, never owned it. But when I was looking at the chart 
for that week, it jumped out at me. It stood out. That stood that stood out for me. No, um, that's true. It's a. Uh, do you remember the video? I had to YouTube I the do. video uh, when they were. I do remember the video. They're all outside sitting on a park bench at the start, and then they're like they're on skateboards and that. They're not. Aye, uh, scooters. Sorry, scooters. It's just some Canadians acting like Americans on spring break. That's, that's right, aye. It's, it's the type of folk you didn't want to turn up to your hotel on holiday and see that are actually in your hotel because you, <laughs> you, you just you, you would just actually go go uh, utterly mental. Um, Another another song which reminds me of that time, uh, it was a former number one, is the Wham Do Project, King of My Castle. I can remember going to pubs in Stirling and that always was getting played. And it's utter yeah. gash. It's utter, it is utter, it's utter, it's utter uh, But again, as soon as I saw that, I can remember it in the warehouse and being in certain pubs. That's funny that pub. as old as that as well, eh? I know. You still hear it just now. It's still, it's still, it's still gets played just now. Um, we'll move on to the albums now. Um, Travis were number one, yep. uh, a man who, and uh, Travis ended up in the chart for thirty six weeks with a man who, and it spent eleven weeks at number one. I re really listened to it and I didn't understand why. I really didn't understand. It's very for me. It's bland. It's so bland that my Magnolia Law would reject it now. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I would say they, they. I think that album, when you look back, was just very much successful on the back of a genre of music that had been extremely successful in the decade preceding it. And then there was a lot of pop music that was kind. Robbie Williams released albums that were kind of guitar based and just sort of three chord guitar numbers and all that as well like old before I die singles like that and then Travis's album to me is wishy washy um, and it's just it was almost formula based going well this is what sells right now and they've just done an album of that the best song on that The Man Who is the secret track Blue Flash and Light so if you just I mean this was this was big back then so one day I'm obviously playing the Sega Mega Drive or something like that Kev you know what I mean and gross, and I've, I've been playing the Man Who album. There's me slagging it, right? I don't repeat it at the time. But like, I've got it on. I've got it on. I've obviously forgot because I'm so engrossed at whatever level I'm on. You know what I mean? Labyrinth Zone or something like that. And this song starts playing. There's obviously been silence for 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And then another song starts playing. And it's a secret track that's on it called Blue Flash and Light. And he swears in it and he's a bit edgy in that. And I'm like, obviously loving that because I'm. 10, you know what I mean? I'm 12 years old, you know what I mean? But looking back, that tune is actually, I still like that song and it sounds nothing like the rest of the album. So that, that's, that I would say, I would recommend if you're going to, The Man Who Blue Flashing Light is the secret track on it. Secret it, track. It, it is actually a tune. But I, I mean, looking back, I used to love that with CDs. Just play the last track and then of course what happened was every album I bought after that, I've got Natalie and Brugler on at one point just going... <laughs> He thinks he's got a secret track at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Gabriel's greatest hits. I know. And, and, 20 minutes. Come it, on. Seemed, it seemed to be a trend because I remember the Verve had it. The Verve had about 15 minutes after the last song on a, a Urban Hums. There's another track appears. Oasis right. has done it as well. It just seemed to be. It just really used to annoy you. <laughs> it used to annoy me. I just go, just put it on. Just, but nowadays that would just be a bonus track on Spotify. Isn't yeah, but see when you look back, that's far more boring than what they were doing. See if you if you uh, think about it, because there was more mystery involved. Um, I it wasn't it wasn't it, unless you had a, a, a fancier CD player that told you like how long's remaining on the last track, and you're going, that still says ten minutes. The song's finished. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Track ninety nine on the set and coming. I can't. Uh, a, a new producer, Paul, was going to come in with, come in, <laughs> come in with that one. Eh? But the man who sold three point five million copies. Frightening. That is absolutely frightening. Uh, I, 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 as you say, it's one. It's one of these albums. I bought it. 
I've got it. I have got the album, but is it? But it's aged dreadfully for me. That has absolutely. I probably only listened to it for a couple of months, then never went back to it because at that time, my musical tastes were were actually were, were changing quite a bit. Um, look at the single. Why does it always always rain on me? That's a novelty record. That's like dignity be Deacon Blue. That's just a. That's just. Oh, that's a great Scottish song. It, it, it right. sums up being Scottish. Why does it always rain, rain on it's a me? Oh, it's terrible. It's a terrible song. Um, couple of couple of albums coming in there. Super Furry Animals, uh, Radiator, fantastic album. Love that album. Uh, Parachutes, Coldplay. I'm no. We've we, me and Paul had a discussion about this uh, on an, well, another, a, a, another podcast. Before we go. Well. Bedwetters, bedwetters. Uh, are, you, are you taking what, what was it? Liam Gallagher co- called it a. Uh, he was a geography teacher, I think. Top <laughs> shop music, or was that Alan McGee? It called it top shop music, the kind of music you hear in top shop when you're buying <laughs> cars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think he says yeah, something like that. Rubbish, it's rubbish. I, anyway. Another album that jumped out at me uh, is in it. Num- it was at number nine that that week. Was Tales from New York the very best of Simon and Garfunkel? You, 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 you can't you, you can't you can't beat that. Thirty nine. I can't even bother that we did it. Can you not? Know? Well, Simon's got wee man syndrome. Look, he was he was annoy me. I would I would just he'd just get a backhander eventually, man. On his side, you know. Look, oh, I'm raging that Garfunkel sings the songs. Just let the singer sing the songs, Paul. It was the <laughs> deal at the start. Just stick to the deal, mate. I can't even bother with him. It's like 39 tracks are solid gold, then Cecilia. <laughs> Cecilia's an absolutely horrible song for me. But, ah, uh, you're right Laura, there. Laura's <laughs> gutted about the man who. I know, I know, Laura. I feel bad, man. I, 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 I like Laura. I, I do like Laura myself, but it's my opinion. I feel bad, man. I feel like Laura. She, she can have my copy if she wants. I've got I've got the CD up the stairs and she's she's glad sign, uh, <laughs> sign it. I, I'll, I'll sign it. Uh, ah, you're right. Simon and Garfunkel I mean they hated each other like Sutton and Shearer. Absolutely couldn't stand yeah. each other. But they're a fantastic partnership. For yeah. me, they were a fantastic partnership. Uh-huh. And, and the 39 tracks, I'm not counting the Cecilia as a track. The 39 tracks on that, like the boxer, only living boy in New York. I am a rock sound of silence. Top, top quality yep. songwriting. Absolutely top quality songwriting, which brings me to your album, which, yes. you'll, probably, which you'll probably claim as top quality songwriting. Um, I think a lot of people look deeper into music than what I do. I, I'm not someone who looks crazy into like, like, you know, the depth of it. To me, it's what it makes my foot do. It's what it makes my head do. It's like... If I'm going out or if I'm going to a festival, if I'm going to gigs and make me jump about, if I play at my headphones, does it increase my swagger levels from already <laughs> probably 100 to 200? And listening back to performance in cocktails this week has been a really fun, fun-filled nostalgia trip that has took me back to obviously probably later dates than the actual time that we're, t- we're discussing. Because it turns out that album is, I think, it was in the top ten. I think it was number. Was it number four at that week in the in the, the albums chart? I can't remember. Oh, but, it was quite quite high up. But that was actually it turned out it was released in ninety eight. So that tells you the longevity of it at the time, and it went on to sell two point four million uh, records. See, did my homework tell you? Did uh, you know? But um, there was a couple. I mean, singles wise, I think they had three top five singles off it, which at that time was a lot easier for a rock and roll band to do. Um, and I know I, every review I read, because I was trying to get a feel for how it was perceived at the time when I was looking online about it. Do you know what I mean? Like to see how well was it received? And it did seem like it was a bit mixed initially. The thing that got me the most was the bartender and the thief reviews I read were never that overly complimentary. And yet as soon as that starts for me, I'm just like, right, let's, Get those sunglasses, you know what I mean? Let's have it. I, I, think it's, I think it's one of those, I think it is one of those songs, eh? I'm like, I don't understand what folk are missing. Um, and then the wall, uh, one of the other singles, Pick Apart That's New, which is definitely more 
mainstream, shall we say, uh, to say the least. But when I heard the riff, all I did was smile widely. That's the honest truth. That, I just was like, I was just smiling, man, as soon as it came on, because obviously the thing is, with music, it takes you back to whatever you, you know, you first sort of listen to it on a consistent basis. So I, I, mean, I was, I was all for that album. I think what was the other one I was listening to? Today? Uh, Hurry up and wait, bit slower. That that was a tune. Uh, that remind you know the, the album itself actually reminds me of like two thousand and. 2006 came to the park at like five in the morning. Do you know what I mean? When you're up far too late and someone's brought a ghetto blaster. Do you know what I mean? Someone's risked the album collection for camping at Tea in the Park. Crazy, crazy these people. They've brought like the CD player, their mum probably bought them. Do you know what I mean? And that collection of CDs just in the name of Tea in the Park and doing it for everyone else. Legends, all of them. Uh, but yeah, it reminds me of that sort of, that sort of vibe. Same with James's greatest hits. That always takes me back to sitting at four or five in the morning at, at tea in the park, especially. Do you know what I mean? Going, I put on that CD and just sitting, you know, obviously just with a couple of waters and uh, enjoy, enjoy myself, you know. But I, I mean, I think that album, I think it, it was four years it stayed in the charts or something in the top 40 um, or something like that anyway. Or it re entered the charts, I should say, in 2004. And then they re-released it again in 2010 with loads of live versions and stuff. But I don't think it's it's an album that um, I don't think it's songwriting genius by any extent. Or answer to your question, I don't think it's quality songwriting. I don't think I don't think Paul Simon or Garf, Art Girl Funk are going to be losing any sleep over performance and cocktails. But at the end of the day, I don't listen to them when I'm walking up to the pub on a Saturday afternoon. Do you know what I mean? I would rather listen to Stereophonics. So, sod them. Simple as that. <laughs> I, I must admit, I never, I never purchased. I, I don't own a Stereophonics album, but for the pur- for the purposes of this show, yeah, right. I recognise all the singles off it because, again, oh, right. I was, because I'm working in a warehouse listening to Radio One, so these singles are getting played and constantly and constantly. And for now, uh, it doesn't remind me. I have to go any. When you go back to Team the Park, how many batteries did these ghetto blasters go through? Eh? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I know, I know. Mad now. It doesn't remind me, uh, like, like those heady times that you're talking about. Eh? I just I, I just picture accountants on a stag doing Whitley Bay singing along to pick a part that's new or just looking or, or something like that. Wait. See, there's the difference, Kev. I picture what I would be doing. You're picturing what other folk are doing and judging. You can't do I, that, man. Well, no, I just think at that time, I just think at that time, a lot of bands were promoted above their pay grade because everybody was looking for a new oasis. I think the generation, maybe your generation, and I, I didn't mean that in a bad way, who had, no, missed, no. who had missed out on peak oasis, gave these bands a platform that somebody, an old fart like oh. me, goes, I didn't think they really deserved that. And listening back to it, I don't think they really deserved it. No, that's fair. I mean, I'll be honest to you, I disagree. I think those students come on. I mean, I went to see them last time at a festival. It, was, it could only have been three, four years ago, four, well, maybe four years ago, five years ago, something like that anyway, uh, which is obviously at that point still 15 years after the album came out. They come out to bartend and the thief, the place goes nuts, and you're, you're, not, and you're not jumping up. And what I would also say to give kudos to that is you're not, you need to remember when you're jumping about then, the guy to your right is 18. Mm-hmm. You know, he was three when the album came out. Yeah, still, it's connecting with him. And he's certainly not of a generation desperate the next oasis. That's not in his mindset. He's just hearing a tune and it's, it's connecting. Do you know what I mean? So, again, I'm not saying it's genius. No. I, but I look at it quite simply. And, and, you know, if a song makes me want to bounce about and, you know, as I say, just turn that wee bit up in the headphones, increase the swagger levels, Put on a pair of sunglasses, maybe wear a leather coat, try and look like Kelly Jones, and I'm all for it. Nothing wrong with that. And he still looks the same, by the way. Have you noticed that? He's that moisturizer. He uses it. Obviously, obviously a far different one for me. If you saw pictures of me in the year two thousand, he looks the exact same. It's bizarre how much he just looks the exact same. He just wears the same clothes too. Just comes out aviator's leather jacket and. You know, you could you couldn't pick what year it is if you see like if you seen 
three photos of, of, of Kelly Jones doing a live gig, and you had to pick which one was 1998 or something like that, you wouldn't be able to do it. No way. The drummer was a bit of a madman. He left, did he know eh? Stuart I'm Cable. sure. Stuart Cable, did he? Uh, I'm sure he oh. did, the drummer. Oh. <laughs> I'm not Stuart. <laughs> I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> Apologies. Laura Bradburn comes in to go, not to sound too girdly, but Kelly Jones is a handsome bloke. I think Russell fancies him as well, just with his description of him there. Ah, good looking boy, definitely. Good looking boy. Definitely. Oh, uh, it has been confirmed that the, the drummer did die, so apologies uh, if I offended right. anybody there. <laughs> I, I didn't actually realise that. Um, the album I'm going to talk about is the album Supreme Clientele, by the Wu Tang Clan, well, no, by the Wu Tang Clan, by a member of the Wu Tang Clan called Ghostface Killer. Were you a bit? Were you into some rap music at that no. time? The uh, hip hop? Not really, not really. I mean, I respect it a hell of a lot more now as I got older. But at the time, no. I mean, it was it was beyond me. The Wu Tang Clan, uh, Clan, the Wu Tang Clan. Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, no. I don't know anything about them, man. No, I don't know anything about this. I, I never, I never heard of this album in my life. But I, if, you you, if you spoke to my mates, they would say, "I know my music." That's honest truth. And yet, I was like, "No, I've not got a scooby with his." They basically the Wu Tang came from Staten Island in New York, and the the guy who done the who done the the beats was a guy called the RZA, R R Z A. And he's a genius. He's an absolutely musical genius. And what they what they, what they done was every there was I can't remember how many my, my mind's been blank here how many members of the Wu Tang they were. But basically, every one of them had solo albums, and they became a phenomenon. They had they had a fashion line. They had tele programs. They had cartoons. They had comics. Wow. They, became, they, they became absolutely massive, and they were basically a bunch of. Rank, rankers for uh, a, a bunch of gangsters for Staten Island in New York for the projects and basically what actually happened uh, the Supreme Crime Tale is Ghostface Killer's uh, second solo album his first his first solo album was called Iron Man and it was an album that the RZA came back the RZA had retired and let all these other producers come in and produce uh, the, the, the Wu-Tang solo work yeah. so the RZA came back into this album and you can actually hear it now he give you a bit of background to this album so I'm sure the stereophonics went down to Rockfield with a bunch of 70 rock LPs maybe a couple of bags of snuff, snuff uh, like a, a bottle of Jack Daniels and recorded the album. Ghostface Killer was really, really ill in about 98 and it was diabetes. But he didn't know it was diabetes and he didn't trust Western doctors. So what didn't help him as well, he was drinking heavily at the time and he was smoking joints laced with angel dust. So his paranoia was completely... All over the shop. Yeah, so you wouldn't be half baked on that, would you? <laughs> so it's <laughs> not half involved. <laughs> so, he, so he basically, so he basically went to Africa to get a witch doctor to cure him. <laughs> so he went to Africa, and the that's result, where this is going. It wasn't the <laughs> Ornelas, was it? No, it wasn't. No, 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 the pastor, the, the priest that he met was the Fernando de Ornelas. I wish that was, though. That would be great. Um, so the RZA went to Africa to find him. So the RZA turned up to Africa to find him. And Ghostface Killer came out. Beard, robes, hair everywhere. Completely cured. This witch doctor had cured them, and they started writing the album in West Africa, wow. watching, watching kung fu films, and the only telly in the village. So they were watching Fist, the Fist of Fury while writing this album. See, that's far better than going to Rockfield and actually drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels. This boy went full, full native. If you pardon the, if you pardon yeah, the term, yeah. there, there. He also. Oh, they were fantastic. The beats are... Ah, that's right. ah, that's right. ah, every, every beat that you hear is like getting rabbit punched in the ki- in the kidneys. It's like getting rabbit... Right. The, 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 the RZA as a producer is a genius. An absolute yeah. genius. He's a musical genius. And I think guys like... Um, 
Ghostface Killer, Method Man, are storytellers. The, the, the rappers are the modern day poets, and they're modern day storytellers. I mean, I don't know what it's like to grow up in the projects in Staten Island. And I don't know, sometimes I don't pick up what they're talking about. And sometimes what they're talking about is misogynist and it's very out of time and it's very degrading to women and, and things like that, which is wrong. But they're for the projects in New York and I'm, I'm not going to back them up. But when you hear the beats and you hear the flow and you hear what they can actually do with, with lines... Uh, with, with bars as, as they call there's one line in it he says I'm swinging like John McEnroe that's a great line I've got eyes like Sammy Davis Jr uh, I like these, that these metaphors are going to get me out of these no, projects I can imagine you appreciating them especially Ken I can imagine that being right up your street <laughs> like things like these these metaphors are going to get me out of these out of this project, and and you're going that that's that's storytelling for the modern. You you, you have in the, in the medieval times you've got all these guys who wrote down on scrolls and scrolls. The rappers have it's American history. It's a black American history in, in rap music for me. Auntie, Auntie Aiken, who actually built this extension that I'm sitting in at this precise moment in time, not Meg Feature in the Rizzo, is one of the best tracks you'll ever hear. It's the first track on Supreme Clientele, and I would recommend anybody to go and listen to that track. It will blow you away. Definitely blow you away. So I was listening to that at that point. I was on a completely different, a, a completely different cloud for the stereophonics at that time. So that's what I was listening to that. Time. And I would recommend, and I would recommend anybody to go and listen to that Ghostface Killer album. Check out Method Man and check out the Wu Tang Back Catalog as well. I think there's something like fifteen hundred albums because there was that many of them. The, 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 they've, they've all made soul albums, and the Rizza for me is a genius. An absolute genius. Brilliant. So, so Russell Nas is a, the best rapper in history. His body of work is far better. I each to their own. I, I, I'm I'm a big Wu Tang head actually. I, I like the Wu Tang better. I like NWA. Uh, if, if I'm going down, I'm not a massive massive uh, hip hop fan, eh, but I do know quality when I actually hear it, and I and I reckon a lot of the Wu Tang stuff tails away as they get into other things and, and they just get older, eh? But the documentary, Sky had a documentary at the turn of this year about the Wu-Tang Clan. I would recommend anybody to watch it. It's uh, If you want to see early 90s hip-hop and what became massive hip-hop, the Wu-Tang started it all for me. Mm -hmm. And also, you wouldn't have Jay-Z's The Blueprint if... Supreme clientele hadn't been made because the two the two producers on Jay Z's The Blueprint, one of them's Keanu West, another one's a guy called uh, Blaze, actually made the beats for the Blueprint, and they wanted to give them a Ghostface Killer, but Jay Z jumped on them and rapped on them, and that became the Blueprint. Wow, so, okay. so there you go. There you go. Very good. So, Russell, we've been blaring for nearly an hour and 20 minutes. Easy done, mate. Easy, Easy done. done. I, want to, uh, I want to thank everybody for their comments. It's been a great laugh. Um, as you've probably found out, that me and me and uh, Russell are not going to be on on Monday because it's National Women's Day and the, the Axon ladies are going to be taking over on Monday. So we'll be back next Tuesday night for another, yes. for another episode of Scream of Selica. 